Football Night in America podcast. We are back. We're just having fun all off season, and it's a pleasure. I got Tony Dungy with me. He's coming to us from sunny Florida, where the weather is awesome. You can see I'm indoors. There's no sunlight coming in. I'm in New Jersey. Coach, how you doing? How's the off season been? I'm doing well, D Mac. Off season has been fun. Got a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Uh, my uh, son, who's a senior in high school. I just selected Butler University, so we're all fired up and happy for him and uh, having a good time. Oh, man, congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, you know, let's jump right in. Uh, I think it's cool to have you on this week because all of these new teams now, this is the first week they're eligible to start the offseason program, and we got the Commanders, the Chargers, the Falcons starting today. I know for me, that was always my biggest fear is that rule came out that, like, new coaches could start earlier, and I was like, Man, I don't want to start early. I never want to be in a season where we're starting and other guys are at home. So as a coach, looking into that and looking forward to it, I'm sure as a new coach, you're going to be excited to get around your team. But how do you balance like some of those veteran guys feeling like, man, the season just ended. I don't want to go back to work. You really do. I can remember my first meeting with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 1996. We had 13 straight losing seasons. I come in, I'm the new coach. and you do. You, you're excited, but you want to transmit that excitement to those veterans who you know they're, they're not excited about being there. So hey, you talk about the, the new way we're going to do things, the new atmosphere, the new culture we're going to get, and we're going to win. And uh, for a lot of those guys, they're sitting there not believing it. Hey, you got to show me something. And that's what you want from your assistant coaches. And for me, I tell you, Dev, I had a great staff at that time. Lovey Smith was new on the staff. Monty Kiffin was our defensive coordinator. Herm Edwards was my assistant head coach. Rod Marinelli had all these young guys fired up to talk about how we're going to change things around. And that's really what you want to get at. That's so interesting because I even I, I was sitting there talking to Gerard Mayo last weekend. They're going to start next week, the Patriots. And he said one of the main reasons was he wanted the staff to only be in the building this week to start to really bond to get to know each other. That's something I feel like people don't always talk about on the outside. It's always like, how does a new coach fit with the players and how does that mesh? But how did you like the names you just, you just named, those are all guys who had, I mean, incredible coaching careers in the NFL. How did you put all that together? And as you were beginning, how did you manage everybody's, whether it's egos or style, how, like, how did that go? That, that was the biggest thing, really. You know some of these guys, but a lot of them don't know each other. So bringing everybody together and say, this is how we're going to do things as Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Everybody's got their ideas. I'm the head coach. I'm going to listen to everybody. But we're going to have a game plan of how we're going to do this. And I'll tell you, the biggest thing, Devin, that brought our group together, uh, we came to an old facility. The, the Buccaneers mm -hmm. facility had been built when they had 40 players and six coaches. So we've got no space. Everything's old. Um, nothing is, you know, modern and up to date. So we only have like nine offices and we've got 13 coaches on the staff. So Herm was the assistant head coach. And I said, well, you get the first pick of offices. He took a, a storage closet that had been made into an office. And he said, I'm going to take this because we're going to be no excuses, no explanation. This is my Ooh. office. It was so small that he had a desk and a chair in there, but he couldn't close the door with the chair. So if he ever wanted to talk in private on the phone, he had to stand up and take the chair out of the office. But he said, you know what? I'm going to go with this just to set the tone that we're all in this together. And I think that brought our whole staff together. Hey, we got one focus, and that's that's the win and nothing else. Man, that's awesome because, like, that's, that's kind of that true leadership stuff. I think even as a player, I think doing those small things, I remember – being a rookie and whether it was going in the training room or being in line and like the veterans would come in and be like, hey, Rook, it's my turn. I'm going to step up. And I remember then becoming a veteran and, and looking forward to doing that. And then once I got in that position, realizing it meant more to stand in the back of the line. And sometimes guys come like, why are you back here? Because I came in last. Those guys were up here. And I just think that speaks volumes of putting a staff together and leadership and all those different things. Um, so that's that's awesome to see. And I, I think it's so interesting because then the, some of the other teams, Seattle, New England, the Titans, they're all saying, you know what, let's take another week and start the week after. And I think it's interesting because as a player, 
I, I look at it as like, it doesn't matter whether you start this week or that week, they're just lifting and running. And you should be doing that on your own. But then I, I remember as a veteran player sitting there like, well, guys don't always do that on their own. So when they get back into the facility, sometimes the first time guys have worked out since they left the building. Usually if you're, you know, you got a new head coach, you probably left the building in January because you didn't make the playoffs. But I always felt like, man, if we can just get back at a good time and have that first day of school mentality of everybody being excited to be back in the building, wanting to learn their new teammate, teammates, getting everything going, that's the best chances. So even though these teams are starting the second week, I still think it creates that same great blend of the new beginnings, new head coach, new coaching staff, and moving forward. So I'm excited to see these guys. And I want to ask you, who's some of the teams you're most excited to see week one that have these new head coaches that are now having these new beginnings? Who's some of those teams that you're like, man, I can't wait to see what they look like week one? I'll tell you, I've, I've got my eye on two teams, the Chargers and the Falcons. And it really comes down to head coach and quarterback. I mean, you need 40, 53 guys. You need to practice the squad. You need the staffs and everybody. But you and I know it comes down to that leadership. And yep. the Chargers, they have a great young quarterback in Justin Herbert. I, I think putting a veteran coach in there who's done it before, Jim Harbaugh has taken the team to the Super Bowl. He knows how to work with quarterbacks. I'm looking forward to seeing that mess. And then at Atlanta, uh, the, the key is Kirk Cousins. Is he going to be healthy? Is he going to stay healthy? If he does, now you've got a veteran quarterback who's done it, and you take Raheem Morris, who's been around the block. He's been a head coach. He's coached in a Super Bowl as a defensive coordinator. I just think putting those two guys together is really going to fire up yeah. and charge up the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, I'm excited to see the Falcons as well. I think I've gotten a chance to be around Raheem Morris a little bit. I still remember coming out into the draft and being at the combine, and he's a Jersey guy, and come in, and he was like the one coach he had on jeans. He had on Nikes. looked like he was just having a good time, and it was one of my first conversations, him and Mike Tomlin at the combine, that it felt like we were just sitting and talking, talking a little bit of ball, talking a little bit of life, that I, it always stuck out to me. Like, man, it would probably be pretty cool – to play for those guys. And the two teams that I'm looking to are the two teams in the draft at number two and number three, the commanders and the Patriots. I think the commanders was this team with Daniel Snyder leaving so much turmoil, so much controversy that I feel like people have forgotten. And you see some of the moves they made from a, a head coaching standpoint with Quinn and with Peters coming in as a GM. It seems like they really focused on, all right, let's really change the guard. And I think, bringing in guys like Bobby Wagner and all of these different moves that they've made have set them up to maybe be a sleeper team this year. And maybe if it's not this year, but it really feels like they're building uh, and, and trying to bring guys in and bring the right kind of guys in. Whereas New England took the approach of let's bring a lot back. Some of the guys that we really like the guys that were drafted in the last few years, they haven't done that in a few years of, you know, drafting guys and then letting them leave in free agency. So these kind of contrasting styles with two teams that need to kind of get it going, rebuild um, with the, the two and three teams in the draft, everything's going to come down to, do you pick the right guy? So uh, I'm, I'm so excited to see those two teams when they start off. But I think one of the other questions is which team has the most pressure to get it going right away? Which team is like, Hey, if they get off to a one and three start or zero and four start, we're sitting there like, Dang, this isn't what we expected. So which team do you think falls in that category? Well, I'm going to hate to say this for you, but your buddy Gerard Mayo, I have to say, is under the most pressure. You never want to follow a legend, and he is following yep. a, a historical figure. And no matter how they start, everybody's going to say, well, Coach Belichick did it this way. Coach Belichick would have done this. And so uh, they've got to get off to a great start. Now, I'm sure people are, are saying, well, Hey, we've got to find a quarterback and we've got things that we, but it's still, you know, he's going to be compared to Bill. And then the other person I think is under a great deal of pressure is David Canales in Carolina. Their owner has proven that he's got kind of a short stick there. <laughs> he's had people for a year, less than a year. So you think, okay, you know, you're going to have time to build and we're going to be patient, but that hasn't been the case there. So I think those two, for different reasons, I think those two head coaches knew are under the most pressure. 
Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree. Those are my one and two teams. And I guess the third team I'll throw in there is the Chargers. I think one of the reasons is because Jim Harbaugh is a proven winner. He's done it in the NFL. He's done it in college. You have Justin Herbert. This is a team that I think, for the most part, everyone watches them. They're like, they just underachieved. They have the different weapons. They have some of the personnel that you would want. And I think they they make it, they did some moves, you know, trading Keenan Allen. I think not pressuring like firing Harbaugh anytime soon, but pressure, I think the fan base and different people want to see what is the ceiling for Herbert? How good can this team be? And I think we all know how fast it happens in the NFL where you have this, this team or this quarterback where you're like, man, they're so good. They're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then out of nowhere, you kind of look up and you're like, well, the time has really passed that team by and there's a new team or a new couple teams that come in. So I would throw the Chargers in there as that like that last team that different from the other teams where it's just like, how can they just maybe just miss the playoffs or sneak into a wild card game? I think the Chargers have the pressure in, can they compete with Kansas City? Can they maybe win the division? Which is sometimes a lot of pressure coming in. You're first now, you're coming in, new head coach in there, but you know, it was different. Harbaugh took San Francisco one year in and he was off to the races. So uh, it's just a very interesting thing. Um, and, you know, Coach Dungeon, you mentioned Belichick being gone, Gerard Mayo stepping in. Do you ever just take time to look at the landscape of coaching and just being like, wow, Bill Belichick's out of here. Pete Carroll's now out of here. And just look up and say, is this a full change of the guard or will we see these two guys back in coaching next year? I'm sure you always get asked or hey, are you going to come back to coaching? Are you interested in coaching again? So how does that always kind of fit in? And then I guess lastly, where there are some coaches when you first got in and was a head coach in 96 in Tampa that you looked up and say, man, those are mentors, and then out of nowhere looked up and they were gone? No, it, it happens. The NFL, I think the owners have one of two thoughts. Hey, I've got to go new. I've got to get this unknown person that nobody knows about or – yeah, I, give me that icon. Give me that that guy who everybody says is going to bring things around. That's why I agree with you that the Chargers are under a great deal of pressure because of the expectation. Uh, hey, you've got a franchise quarterback. Now you've got this coach who we know. He took a, a team to the national championship in college. He took a team to the Super Bowl. He's a proven commodity, and that's what I, I'm looking for. And – uh, to me, that was a, a great choice, uh, Jim Harbaugh, because he brings all that to the table. I was shocked that Coach Belichick did not get a job th this hiring cycle because, you you know, if I'm an owner and I've got a team that I think is close, that that's the guy I want. He's done it. He he knows what it takes to not just compete but to win it all. And, and so, you know, to see him out, to see Pete Carroll out, uh, I, I just think, the next cycle is going to be, okay, we went with some of these young guys. Let me get this established guy back. And I would not be surprised to see those two guys back next year. Um, I, I remember when I came in in 1996, and I was a young guy. I was 40 at the time, one of the youngest coaches then. And I did. I looked at, at gosh, Joe Gibbs. You know, that was my role model, one, one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. um, Chuck Noll had just stepped down. Tom Landry had just stepped down. Jimmy Johnson had just taken over for, for him. So, uh, yeah, you had that kind of changing of the guard. And then you're in it four or five years, and you become one of those older guys that everybody's looking at. <laughs> and uh, that's how quick the landscape changes. And can you just talk about some of the, the learning curve and the mistakes or different things when you come in? And like you said, 40 years old, and I remember seeing – you started as an assistant coach at 25, the youngest assistant coach. Just talk about the journey of that, like how hard it is to learn on the go and be evaluated at such a high level as an NFL coach. Devin, I thought I was prepped and ready to go. i had been an assistant coach for 15 years. I worked for Chuck Noll for eight years on his staff. Thought I learned a great deal from him. Marty Schottenheimer was a tremendous coach. He was my boss for three years. I learned so much from him about details and being on, on the little thing. And then I worked four years for Denny Green. And Denny really, he knew I was going to be a head coach. He prepared me, he worked with me, and I learned so much from him. So I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm ready to go. I go down to Tampa and I call all the veteran guys and have my conferences with them, bring them in. We're ready for, uh, I'm, I'm hiring my staff, actually. 
And I'm thinking, yeah, I got this. I'm in pretty good shape. And the director of football ops comes in to me and says, uh, coach, just one question for you. I need to know what hotels are we going to stay at on the road and what <laughs> airline do we want to charter our flight? I need to know today. I'm like, well, I didn't even thought, what are you talking about? That's not even on my radar. And then you start to think all the things that you don't know, all the things that are going to be new and the things you have to deal with. And that first year, it was a whirlwind with those kind of things. Hey, you talk about starting new. Last year, the Jets started new. They brought in Aaron Rodgers. It's like new beginnings, playoffs, Super Bowl. Here we come. Four plays into the season, he goes down. And now everything everything has turned into 2024. This is our year. And I thought the Jets said, you know what, this offseason, we're going to go all in. They go and they, they trade for Hassan Riddick. They sign Tyron Smith. They do all of these different things. And I think especially looking at them last year, they lose Bryce Huff. They got after the passer so well. So they said, you know what, we'll replace him. We struggled up front. We're going to go get Tyron Smith and bring in a veteran guy to help us. So I'm excited to see the Jets, which I know many people, because of my history of playing for New England and the AFC East, are surprised. But the Jets, I kind of fell in love with last year on Hard Knocks, watching Aaron Rodgers relate to the guys, be in the building. Now all eyes are going to be back on him. And I think him getting hurt early in the season, first game, allows him to really have an offseason, be able to be out there with the guys, throw the ball, get used to being around these guys. So I think the Jets had as good as an offseason that I think a lot of people in this area, in New York, New Jersey area, can say, I'm excited about it. I think one of the last pieces they could do is possibly sign Justin Smith, so Justin Simmons, which, you know, the guy that helps produce this show, James Kaminsky, huge Jets fan, texted me last week, why aren't the Jets signing Justin Simmons? We need him in the building. So I think there's fans that are like, let's make one or two more moves than the draft, and it'll line them up to have success in the AFC East, which, uh, for me, it would be exciting to see if the Jets can, you know, make a run and possibly be a contender this year. What are you thinking, Coach? We had the Jets twice last year. We had them in the um, Hall of Fame game. And there was, so, as you said, so much optimism. And talking to their coaches and their players, Aaron Rodgers, they just raved about what he had done, helping the young guys, um, being that mentor, that kind of big brother figure. And everyone was talking about that. They were so pumped up. Well, obviously he got hurt, and that, that put a damper on things. But then we had him late in the year against the Raiders. And talking to their coaches then, they were all worried about their offensive line. They were good in a lot of places. We can put pressure on the passer. We're good on defense. We've got a great runner. We can pound the ball. Yeah, our quarterback plays a little bit. But our offensive line, that's what we've got to get straightened out. So they made some moves to, to work on that. I think they're right there on the cuff. Obviously, a lot of things are going to – going to uh, depend on how Rodgers does. But I will say this. Sometimes you can make too many moves and you got too many new people. Now, they, there's some great names there and, and they brought in a lot of talent. But how can that gel together and play as a team, as a unit? To me, that is going to be the question for the Jets. And with that said, when we look at this team, I still, for me, I still say, Buffalo, as I look at their roster, I'm still saying Buffalo is the team to be in the AFC East. Coach, do you think this Jets' new roster, what they've been able to do, adding a guy like Mike Williams on offense, would you take this roster as the number one roster in the AFC East? No, I, I still think that the Bills are the team to beat. And the Bills have a quarterback that can win big games, that has proven to win big games. Uh, the Bills still have some very good defensive players, and they've got that, that mystique. The Jets, New England, Miami, everybody's chasing the Bills right now. And it's like you guys used to be. And you can lose some guys and whatever, and everybody made moves. Oh, we're going to catch the Patriots. Oh, well, you still got to catch them on the field. You got to do it <laughs> on Sunday at 1 o'clock. So we have to wait and see on that. I'm still thinking Bills, number one. The gap is closing, but they're still chasing them. And that's what I love about this time of the year. We all sit back and fans or media experts, whatever you want to say, we kind of get so into the offseason moves and we're like, this team is going to do this. They're going to do that. Philadelphia gets Saquon Barkley. They're going to go do this and that. And then we're reminded as soon as the end of July hits that, OK, football starts and everybody has to go out there and actually win football games on the football field. 
not just with transactions and drafts and all of those cool things, which we love watching and we get excited about, but there's still the game of football that takes 11 guys working together to win. And I thought that was a great point you said of teams having to be able to mesh personalities, styles, all of that has to go together. And as we talk about that, playing football, winning games, we're going to do a little draft here. We're going to talk about you got one game to go win, current coaches only. What are the top coaches you would pick? And Coach Dungey, I'm going to let you go first, which is probably a huge disadvantage to me because Hall of Fame coach, but we're going to let you go first and go with your first pick in the draft, and I'll get the next two. I appreciate you giving me the first pick, and I, I don't think there's any question right now. If I've got to win one game and I'm taking a coach, I'm taking Andy Reid. Winning the big games, he, he's uh, kind of manipulating the offense uh, the way he wants it, game planning, uh, coming out the gate hard with those first 15 plays, and also that guy who his team believes in him, and, and they are going to play for him. So if I'm trying to win one game right now, I'm taking Coach Reed. I like it. And that's what I looked at this too. I looked at the guys that we know can do the X's and O's, but the guys that somehow year in and year out, their guys just rally for them. And that brought me to my number two guy, Sean McVay with the Rams in LA, just the way that team's rallied around them. I got to be out there a little bit this season uh, to interview Stafford and just seeing their energy getting ready for the playoffs and how they believe, even though the season was a little up and down, it just seems like he finds a way to get those guys ready to go and play in the biggest moments. And I think the obviously no-brainer is a guy still holding it down for the old guard, Mike Tomlin at Pittsburgh. It just feels like they can have a great Hall of Fame quarterback like Ben, ben Roethlisberger. They can have guys that we're not sure if they're going to be there next year, Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph this year. And still we look up and we're like, Pittsburgh is in the playoffs again. And I think that comes from the kind of competitiveness, the leadership Mike Tomlin has, and just the way that those guys, was, they say any given Sunday, give us a chance to go play for Coach Mike T. We're going to give it all we got. And I really enjoy seeing what Mike Tomlin's been able to do and obviously why he's still one of the best coaches in the NFL. Coach, who you got next? Well, for my next pick, Devin, I'm going to go to – uh, stay in the AFC North and take John Harbaugh. He's another guy who's done it for a long time. Uh, we kind of forget how good he's been over the years, but he has his team ready to go, uh, especially in the playoffs. And I would take Coach Harbaugh next. That's a good one. The next guy I would take after Harbaugh is Kyle Shanahan. Kyle Shanahan has taken a lot of heat um, because – Obviously, they've lost two Super Bowls, but I think just getting there, the work he puts in, the preparation, the way this team is built, has been a lot of fun to see. Um, and I think he's going to continue to do that. I think he's going to continue to be out in front, to lead this team, to put them in all the right situations. So Kyle Shanahan's a guy I would definitely take, has a seventh-round quarterback playing like an all-pro player the last two years. So it's fun to see. Coach, you take the next two. Next two. Okay, I like it. And it's funny, <laughs> I got my draft board set up here, and we've taken the top five off, off the board already, so I think we're in, in good shape. But next, I'm going to go with a name that might surprise some people, D'Amico Ryans. He hasn't been around mm. long, but I love the way his team plays. I love the approach that they've had. Uh, he did a great job as defensive coordinator for the Niners. And then First year head coach taking the team to the playoffs and then, and then having a dominant game in the first round against Cleveland. I just love the way his players react to him. So I'm going with D'Amico Ryan's next. And then my next pick would be Doug Peterson. Mm. Again, another name that maybe some guys forget. Um, offensive coordinator, lights out and, and some big moments for Andy Reid. Matched up against Bill Belichick in the Super Bowl, put up almost 40 points uh, in a Super Bowl game against a, a defensive mastermind uh, and some really good players on, on the defensive side of the ball. So uh, I, I got a chance to cover the, the Jags, and I saw, again, how their players respond to him as a person, a, as a, a leader, and um, it, he's a guy I have a lot of respect for. Uh, I agree. I was I was on the field as those 40 points was going up and Nick Foles was throwing the ball all around on us. So 
Uh, Doug Peterson, definitely one of the top coaches. Uh, the next pick I'm going to go is going to surprise people too because it's a risk taker, but I'm going to go Dan Campbell. And I think Dan Campbell took a team like Detroit where a lot of us expected, like, okay, they had a good run at the end of the season before, and they can now just make the playoffs. They're going to be in good shape. And then we kind of looked up and it was like, this team has a chance to maybe be in the Super Bowl as we got to the end of the season. And again, it goes back to these guys love playing for him. He's built a staff, a lot of former players in there, a lot of different guys who have great leadership qualities that guys want to play for. So, yes, is he going to take some chances and some risks that a lot of times when I watch I'm like, probably not. But I think that team loves doing that. I think as they move forward, I think they're going to continue to get the guys in there that can execute on some of those fourth down plays they fell short on. And I think Dan Campbell will be there giving this team a chance to win those big games. Who you got next, Coach? And for my fifth pick, I'm taking a little bit of a hometown pick, but a guy I have a lot of respect for, Todd Bowles. He's here in Tampa. Uh, he's taking teams to the playoffs. He's come up with some amazing defensive game plans against some of the, the great ones. And, again, he's a guy that his players love to play for. Uh, so in a big game uh, with equal footing, I, I like Todd Bowles a lot. I like it. And, and like you said, we got down all the way through. So now with my fifth pick, I'm going to go a little bit on the limb. I'm going to I'm going to take a chance here. Another defensive guy. Well, actually, no, I'm going to go offensive guy. I'm going to go with Mike McDaniel. I'm going to go Mike McDaniel in Miami. And I know it hasn't been perfect in some of the big games, but the way that they've been able to continue to play at a high level all throughout the season, they got to find a way to finish strong. A year ago, they had some injuries as they went to Buffalo and had to play without Tua. And then this year, going to Kansas City for a team in South Florida with historic temperatures was another tough battle, <laughs> freezing. So I think they got to figure out a way to find, find a way to get that number one seed and try to play at home, which would be tough with Kansas City. But again, I think Mike McDaniel has guys that believe in his method. They do the right things all throughout the season. I think they'd have to figure out how to be that team all the way throughout December and January. But this is a team that he comes in. Brian Flores had won nine games, nine games winning team, and he took them and he did what we talked about earlier, taking a team and now taking the next step. So now they're going to have to take another step for him. But he's a guy that I love watching. I've got a chance to talk to him a few times. Just everything about him is authentic. And that I'm sitting there like, man, I, I think I would like playing for this guy. He's a little quirky, but he gets guys going because he's just himself. So uh, I think this is a pretty good list right here, Coach. I think we will win a lot of games with these guys. Yeah, I do like our list here, no, no doubt. And uh, what it is, it's a mixture, too. You've got some of the old guard. You've got some new guys. But I think the one thing with all 10 of these guys, Devin, is their players love playing for these guys. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, just a great group of guys. And I think the biggest thing is they're leaders of men. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this list, and we talked about it earlier. Bill Belichick's not coaching. If we had to do this list, where do you think he would fall in, Coach? Where would you put him on this list if you had to pick? We're trying to win one game, Devin. I'm calling him first game. and see if he can come out of <laughs> retirement before I call any of these other guys. For one game, he's my guy. That's just so interesting. Everybody will talk about a bunch of different things, but my opportunity for 13 years to play for him, anytime we had a bye week, the Super Bowl, anytime those things came up, his record would jump up in an article and it'd be like one loss, two loss since his time in New England. So there's no doubt about it. Extended time, one game. I'm picking Coach Belichick. Now, Coach, for Probably the best part of this podcast we've been doing the offseason is just a little bit of story time. And obviously with the draft and the pro days and all that stuff that's coming up or has gone on, we just felt like, hey, let's dive into draft stories and different things. And, you know, I know you're probably going to have some of the best stories. So I'm going to start just with my draft stories. And I think one of the coolest things I had, one of the visits where the team comes and works you out. And Cleveland had, I think it was like a top 10 pick. And Knew they weren't picking me there, but I, I was possibly going to be a second rounder. So they fly to New Jersey and they're going to work me out. And I'm talking to Rob Ryan and he figures out, hey, I'm coming to Jersey. He calls his brother Rex and he said, I'm, co I'm coming to Jersey. So Rex is like, well, I'm down the road. 
I'm in Florida Park. I'll drive up. So now I'm sitting in our offices at Rutgers, Rob Ryan, Rex Ryan. And I'm sitting here like, oh, man, these guys are twins. I'm a twin. We'll have a great time. And being a twin, I knew exactly what it was. When they got together in the meeting room, they forgot anything else existed. They were talking about college stories. They were catching up. The workout begins. We go to the field. I look over in the corner. Those guys are in the corner having a good time, laughing, joking. Coach Dungey, I think they might have watched two minutes of the actual workout, and everything else was just catching up. And I knew right from there, I was like, well, probably not going to Cleveland. The Jets might have already watched some stuff since I'm right in the backyard, but I, I don't know how this is all working out. But being a twin, I fully understand not seeing your brother all the time and probably for a long period of time. They were just catching up, but it was one of those very interesting things. And I'm sitting there like, I don't think this workout's supposed to go like this. <laughs> you feel like, hey, hey, guys, I yeah. can't catch the ball. <laughs> I can't run. I, I did pretty well. <laughs> exactly. Well, What's some stories my, you my got? First uh, draft memory, I go back to the 1995 draft. I was defensive coordinator with the Minnesota Vikings. And we had John Randall and Chris Dolman. We had a really good defense, two Hall of Fame anchors. But there's two guys in the draft that uh, I really, really had my eye on. And I didn't know if we'd get him, but all of a sudden I, I got closer. Warren Sapp was coming out in that draft. He was supposed to be a top three pick. And there, there were stories coming around and, and you know, what's going to happen. So we hadn't done a whole lot of work on Sapp, but then Denny Green comes into me and says, we, we hear Sapp may fall. We got to do some homework on this guy. So we send our scouts down, our, our coaches. We do a lot of work, and we do here. Hey, he's a little tough to handle at times, but a leader, smart guy. He's a guy you want on your team. So we finally come to the conclusion we had the 11th pick. If he drops, we're going to take him. So I go home that night, the night before the draft, I'm all fired up and I'm excited. And I come in the next morning and Coach Green says, uh, we got some news, something else happened. We can't take Warren Sapp. And my face just dropped. Man, are you kidding me after all this? So sure enough, Sapp is falling. You know, they had him on the phone with his agent. He's in the, in the green room and he's dropping eight, nine, ten. So 11, our pick comes. He's still on the board. And I'm just, man. So we take Derek Alexander, really good player, but not on set. The very next pick, and Tampa Bay doesn't even let 10 seconds go off the clock. They take Warren Sapp. So I'm sitting there thinking, man, not only do we not get him, he's going to play against us for, for the rest of his life. So now I'm going to focus on one other guy, Derek Brooks. He's an undersized linebacker. So this is a guy we, we've got to get. I go to Denny. Hey, we got another pick at the end of the first round. Brooks could be the guy. Then he said, no, we can't take two defensive guys. We're going to take an offensive guy. we got an offensive tackle. we got our mind on. All right, well, maybe our pick at the top of the second, maybe we can get to him. We're going to pick, and Tampa Bay makes another trade, goes up above us, and takes Derek Brooks. So now, Devin, I don't even want to watch the rest of the draft. I'm just like, I cannot believe this. My two guys, I can't get them, and they're going to our competitors. And I'm just super bummed. I don't even know what happened the rest of the draft. But the way God would have it, nine months later, I'm the head coach of the Tampa Bay Bucks, and those two Hall of Famers are sitting there waiting for me. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. Just to think that, and I love it too, as a defensive coordinator, you're sitting there like, man, why can't we take two defensive guys? Let's, yeah. let's get these defensive guys. <laughs> let's dominate on defense. And then before we got on, you talked about being with Bill Polian and drafting guys and going back and forth and debating. Can you just give us one of my favorite players watching growing up was Bob Sanders. And you talked a little bit about Bob Sanders in that draft. Can you just talk about that? Yep, 2004 draft. And we've been really, really good on offense. We had drafted uh, Peyton Manning, Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Dallas Clark. We got all this offense in place. So finally, we're going to get a defensive player. And we got our eye on Bob Sanders. Now, Bob Sanders is five foot eight. <laughs> And so that's knocks him off a bunch of people's boards right there. And then he had a foot injury. He's walking around on his pro day in, in a boot. And the doctors, we don't know if he's going to come through. So he's our guy, but we know nobody's going to take him in the first round. So we're sitting there. We can drop down a little bit, get some extra picks, and we can still get the guy we want. 
So we, our, our pick comes up 28th to 29th in the first round. We move down, get a couple of extra picks, extra third rounder, extra fourth rounder. We're down in the second round now. And I tell Bill Polian, I think we can move down one more time. I think we can move to the top of the second. If he'd had a gun, he would have shot me. He said, we're not losing this guy. This is our guy. Pigs get fat. Hogs get slaughtered. We are going to make this pick right now. I don't care what anything says. We picked Bob Sanders, and, and it was he was right. He was a great player for us, catalyst to our, our defense. And that was one of the few times we had a little disagreement. But fortunately, I was smart. I let him win. Man, that's awesome. And Bob Sanders, I mean, I think for any young guy that played defensive back, he was under, like you said, undersized, but flew around, hit everything, playmaker. So I'm happy you guys picked him. That was so fun to watch. And last night I got a chance to go up to Albany and I watched Caitlin Clark in person, and it was ridiculous. She got in the zone, finished with 41 points. The shot she was hitting, like just everything she was doing was unbelievable. And I thought we would end the show the last word of, have you ever either coached a player, coached against a player, lined up against a player that it just felt like, man, he's in the zone. There's nothing we can do. This is just amazing to watch. What guy comes to your name when you think about that? Those type of performances, Devin, I think back to 1989 and Barry Sanders. Uh, he was amazing. And – I think the third or fourth game I'm coaching in Kansas City and we're playing against this rookie and everybody's talking about it and I'm watching the tape and, man, it looks it looks scary. Well, the third or fourth play of the game, he catches a little screen pass, runs through the entire team and goes to the goal line. And I said, man, th this guy is really, really something. Then for the next 10 years, it seemed like he would have those kind of performances against us every year. And it, it was just like the highlight film version that was just incredible. And, and to me, that's, that was my nightmare. That was my Caitlin Clark, Barry Sanders for 10 years. Yeah, for me, I mean, I feel bad for you because every time Detroit plays on our, we have Detroit for our game, they always find Tampa Bay, Barry Sanders highlight games to show. So Those two 80-yard runs against us with John Lynn, <laughs> exactly. right? The whole missing him, him going to the house, yeah. <laughs> And for me, obviously getting to play with Tom Brady, but for me it was 2016, that year for Brady. Gets suspended four games, comes back, and we're playing in Cleveland. And Cleveland has some of the best fans in the world. Of They don't root for the other team. And out of nowhere, we're, getting, we're hearing Brady chance. I think he throws for like four touchdowns. And in that year, yeah, I think he has 28 touchdowns, only two interceptions. And then obviously we end that year with the greatest comeback where – the end of the game, he's just on fire. For me, that was just unbelievable to see a guy obviously compete and play at a high level year in and year out. But then to have that adversity hit where you get suspended four games, two years later, it's still a thing. And you just, hey, I'm suspended now. I'm going to sit out and then I'm going to come back and be the best version of myself. It was like he was destined to win a Super Bowl and that team. So that was so fun to just watch him. We, we, we beat San Francisco, won the plane back. Everybody's having a good time, long flight. He's sitting in his seat, laptop open, watching film. He was just so zeroed in that year. That was really cool to see. So, Kayla Clark, unbelievable for what she's doing for women's basketball and women's sports in general. But, I mean, just the game of basketball is fun to watch her. And it's also fun to look and see our sport and see guys that can compete at that level and do it. So, Coach, I appreciate you jumping on. I know we'll probably do this one more time or two more times this offseason. So enjoy the offseason. Sure, I'll be seeing you soon, man. All right. Thank you, Devin. Great being with you. And uh, can't wait for 2024 to get kicked off. There we go. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.